Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Today, we begin a three-part series on a very interesting niche in real estate, and that is hospitality, where you focus on nightly instead of monthly rental. In the wake of COVID, how does it look? Where is there opportunity? We'll start to learn the answers to those kinds of questions today, and we've got a great guest on the Real Estate Guys radio program. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, as usual, co-host and financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. It's so interesting watching how real estate has reacted to the pandemic. It's different in different types of real estate. It's different in different parts of the world. And so much so that a few weeks back, we had Danielle DiMartino Booth on our program. She spent nine years inside the Federal Reserve in Dallas. And today, she does an amazing job of keeping people up to speed with her newsletters and her other publications and being a guest on podcasts like ours, talking about what's happening, big picture economy, Federal Reserve, money printing, all of that. But more so than almost anybody in her space, she focuses on real estate, which is why we love to have her on the program. And she said uh, an interesting comment. She talked about how uh, in hospitality, there were the business hotels and those kinds of things that weren't doing well and weren't likely to for some time as conventions go online, as people are recognizing they don't need to be face-to-face -face in a room if they can be face-to-face -face on Zoom. And then she said, separate from that is hospitality and resort properties and vacation properties. And there's a pent up demand for that. And that got us thinking about the whole topic of hospitality and those types of properties. It's been part of our portfolio for many, many years. We like this niche for lots of reasons. Discretionary income is one. Higher than average ROI is another. And path of progress, but at the same time, it is an area that's been affected. So we're going to spend the next uh, few weeks taking a little deeper dive into hospitality. Well, I think the thing that's important to remember is that when you're investing in real estate, you're really investing in a demographic. And the real estate needs to serve that demographic or they're not going to pay for it. And so the art of real estate investing is trying to figure out who has the money and what do they want. And that kind of changes when the world changes. And obviously, we've been through uh, a lot of change. And that change is not just COVID. Right now, when you talk about change, you think, oh, my gosh, you know, the whole world changed in the beginning of 2020 when the coronavirus hit. Well, yeah, that's true. But real estate was already changing before that. Amazon was already changing the face of retail. That was going on. Airbnb was changing the face of the hotel industry. Uber and Lyft and these ride sharing services were changing the face of the taxi business. And so that wasn't a direct correlation to real estate. But the point is technology and human behavior and demographics with the millennial generation coming up even bigger than the baby boomer generation. And of course, the baby boomer generation being in a certain season of life. Life. So it is a very, very dynamic and fluid environment. And when one thing happens, uh, it isn't really the only thing, may not even be the biggest thing. It may only just be the current thing that everybody's paying attention to. And an astute investor is going to be able to look at what those macro trends were before the big thing that distracted everybody and caused the, everybody to scatter. Because what happens when that happens is sometimes deals become available. What happens is everybody's cruising along and there's a long-term trend happening. And then all of a sudden, boom, a big event happens. Everybody runs and they abandon quality assets or it, it triggers a shift where a trend that was happening slowly all of a sudden gets 
turbocharged. And so we've seen some of that stuff happen and some of that is happening in this space. So I'm super excited uh, to be talking about this particular topic because when I look around for hot trends and what things are interesting to real estate investors and what things economically seem to be working in spite of all the weird things going on in the world, you know, the concept of hospitality and especially short-term rentals has actually been a pretty good space to be in. Now, spending three weeks in a row on hospitality might sound like a lot, but I'm going to guarantee you're going to learn some things you hadn't thought of. You're going to discover some creative thinking and the lessons from the entrepreneurs you're going to meet are going to benefit you no matter what part of real estate you're invested in. But hospitality has been a unique animal for many, many years. If you own single family rental houses, then you typically have longer term tenants. It's, it's great when a tenant stays for three or four years, right? That's a big chunk of time. That's a lot less vacancy. That's uh, not much turnover. That's great. In the hotel industry, it's the extreme, right? Think about an airport hotel. The average number of nights someone stays at an airport hotel is one. And so that's the opposite of that management. If that were true, one night per guest, then you've got up to 365 turns a year, that's an incredible amount of management and so forth. But the price that someone will pay for that is also quite high, plus the ability to sell ancillary services and so on. Hospitality is its own animal, but I think you're going to learn some clues over the next few weeks and certainly today about how the average investor can play in this space. Yeah. Sometimes people get into real estate and they, they get into things they don't understand. And a lot of people that are smart start with something they do understand. That's why a lot of people start with just residential houses. You know, most of the people have lived in houses and they understand houses. And then when they learn how to play the game a little bit bigger, they get into multifamily uh, because again, it's just a variation on a theme, uh, maybe mobile homes. I mean, and you can start to play the game at different levels, but most of us have also vacationed. Most of us have also stayed in resort properties. Most of us have been in hotels. Most of us have had some of that experience. So again, we kind of get the model. I mean, it's a lot different than trying to figure out how to run a farm or how to run an industrial complex or even how to make sense of a mall. I mean, we visit malls, but being a mall operator, so it's a little bit different. And, and the other thing is, is there's certain aspects of real estate where you can start small and build. And, you know, this is a particular niche that we're going to be talking about today. That's one of those. You don't have to be a multimillionaire to get started in this space. You can become one, but you don't have to start out there. The key is, is just kind of learning what the game is in terms of where you stick to the basics. Where do you find the right property? Where do you find the right market? How do you find the right people and present the right offering? And I would think that the marketing is a lot more complicated than just trying to rent a property. Most people, I mean, they, they know they need a roof over their head and it's a pretty simple value proposition. When you're starting to talk about something a little bit more special, then you're going to have to market a little bit better uh, to, to the needs of the demographic. But, but once you figure that out, then you have a real opportunity because once you create the templates, then you can begin to duplicate that over multiple properties. And so you can have multiple properties without having to start out with multiple properties. And so that's another great thing about this niche. You know, you mentioned agriculture and you think about the typical farm is maybe a section, so 640 acres. And you think about how immense that is and how much you have to learn about soil and nutrition and weather and farm science and seeds and seasons and all that. You're like, wow, that's just so much. But lots of folks today are able to break agriculture up. We have folks in the real estate guys world that help people buy an acre of property that's co-managed. And so all of a sudden there's a way for a person to play. It might be impossible to compete with Sheraton and Hilton and Hyatt and Marriott. But it's not because through the wonderful vehicle of vacation rentals, folks like you and me are playing in that space. And you're going to meet a good friend of ours that not only does that at a very high level, he teaches people to do it as well. When we come back, we'll say hello to our friend Tim Hubbard today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. In uncertain times like this, it's great to know there are two things you can always count on. High demand for affordable single-family homes to live in and Terry Kerr's amazing Memphis team at Mid-South Home Buyers to find, fix, and manage the next addition to your recession-resistant real estate portfolio. 
The Memphis market is a logistics and distribution dynamo with an economic engine that's essential to moving goods and critical supplies all over the United States. Quality rehab, proven profitable property management, affordable rents, and solid ROI make turnkey property investing through Terry's team a dream when it matters most. To learn more about Memphis and Mid South home buyers, send an email to Mid South at realestateguysradio.com. That's Mid South at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, ever wished you could go back in time and do some tax planning? Now you can, just like Marty McFly. Lucky for you, a brand new federal law just made this possible with an EQRP to get tax deductions and reduce your taxable income from last year so you can use that tax savings to invest in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, even your own business. Whether you're a full-time investor, doctor, government employee, even if you have five or 50 employees, the EQRP works and is your secret weapon and now it's retroactive. Hey, I'm Damian Lupo and we have your solution. By the way, if you got bad advice and used an IRA for an apartment syndication, you are sitting on a U-bit time bomb. But don't worry, there's a solution, the EQRP. The EQRP company is ready to help you get control of your money, kill U-bit, and help you pay way less taxes. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report. Paying tax or letting Wall Street suck you dry is dumb. Your first step is freeing your retirement money by sending an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com today. Hi, this is Kevin Harrington, an original shark from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this great radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com. It's part one today of our three-part series on hospitality, and specifically this week, we're going to talk about an easy way to get involved in the hospitality industry, and that's through overnight vacation rental properties. Imagine a beautiful little condo somewhere that you could live in or you could rent out, but folks would love to come stay there for a night or a week or a weekend to help us discover more about that uh, from Rest Methods. Let's say hello to our friend, Tib Hubbard. Hey, Tim. Hello, hello, nice to be back. Well, it's good to have you back on the program. You're always traveling. You spend a lot of time in Colombia, I know. You've just spent a big chunk of time in Brazil. Where in the world are you today? I'm actually back in the US. So I got back here about 10 days ago, but yeah, I've been in Brazil pretty much the whole year until now. Now you, you're traveling again, so it's changed a bit and uh, we were going to want to get the insight on that. But before we talk about how COVID has affected your business, give us the quick value proposition in what you've been doing all these years with these vacation rental properties. Yeah. You know, I, I started with real estate, uh, like many others with small single family, small multifamily with traditional long-term rentals. And as I was growing my portfolio and looking for new and better properties and better places. I realized that a lot of those same properties could be rented as short-term rentals. And I kind of flipped the switch and instead of renting them long-term, I put furniture in them and rented them short-term and they've been chugging along. So I've been adding more and more. Well, and that's an interesting point because you're taking what was typically something rented from month to month and renting it on a shorter basis, but for more money. Kind of explain that part of it because it may seem obvious to folks, but you're changing the nature of an asset without changing the asset. Yeah, yeah. So the asset stays the same. And as long as it's legally permitted in whatever city we're in, they're essentially a guest instead of a resident. So most all of our stays are under 30 days. So, uh, you know, they don't have resident rights, um, but they're also paying much more per night than we would get with a long term tenant. Sometimes, you know, five times or more. And Tim, typically this isn't just, we call them vacation rentals, but your units aren't just rented to people that are on vacation. Talk about kind of the wider demand for this type of product. Yeah, actually, most all my properties are not vacation rental. People certainly come to these cities for vacation, but I would define my properties as more of like an urban type of rental, not super dense urban, but kind of somewhere in the middle between suburbs and downtowns. So we get people coming for all sorts of reasons, a lot of tourism. In the past, a lot of business, we're still getting business travel, but I think just the way a lot of people are living now has changed. We're all virtual and remote. So, you know, even if someone doesn't need to travel to one of these cities to work, they might want to just for a change of change of pace. And if they can work from home, then it provides a good place for a lot of people to uh, 
experience new places. Well, that may be a good transition uh, into we're going to talk about how your industry and your niche within real estate has been affected by the pandemic. But just the idea that today people want a little more than a hotel room rather than just have, you know, a bed and a nightstand and a shower. It's like, well, I'd love to have a little kitchen and maybe a little patio area and maybe a living room. And so for many years, the overnight vacation rental business has been able to provide a little nicer, a little home or stay at or even below the price of a hotel? Yeah, I mean, it's there's such a wide range with nightly rentals. I mean, we've seen everything now from someone renting a tree house, you know, to some 20,000 square foot mansion and everything in between. So there's so many, so many different ways to do it. And there's a, a lot of benefits, you know, families traveling together that can stay in one space versus a small little hotel where they can cook together and just take advantage of some different setups, you know, that they might not traditionally find in a hotel. Now, Tim, let's talk about specifically what you've seen. You've got lots of these in different markets. So you're not just in one geographic market. In fact, you're not just in one single country, but talk about COVID hitting and what you've experienced just in terms of having a, a property that's an overnight rental. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely been an interesting, uh, you know, year, a little more than a year. And it really, I think we've all noticed it's, it's very different depending on the market. So some markets in terms of short-term rentals had a really hard time. Some even did better, you know, uh, just depending. We, here in the U.S., we've seen a lot more people with drive to destinations. So people weren't getting on planes as much. But I was really shocked to see, you know, we did have a drop in occupancy. Some properties worse than others and a drop in in rates, mainly just March and April of last year when, when lockdowns were really, really hard, but it's really surprising to be in like the the worst year for travel in in my lifetime, really. And, and still keeping these properties occupied and still having people come in. So it's been very interesting, but, but I guess in a nutshell, it's really depends on the market. Well, and that's going to be true in any real estate you buy. You got to think market first, right? Because the market drives kind of everything. But I think what's interesting about this particular niche is it's not just Orlando and San Diego and Manhattan that makes sense for these kind of rentals. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about how you do decide to pick a market. What do you go through and what are the things you look for that makes it a potentially good market for this type of product? Uh, so, yeah, I look for a lot of the things that I would look for a traditional long term rental uh, is a lot of the same fundamentals, you know, good migration trends, people moving to the new market. That's going to be great for rental rentals in general, but also for short-term rentals as people try to discover new cities and things like that. So economic growth, uh, landlord friendliness, you know, where the regulations are easier. And I, and I found um, not always, but kind of in general, that the places that tend to have, that tend to be a little more landlord friendly are also a little easier with short-term rental regulations. But that's another step that we have to take to make sure we don't get a property in an area that we can't rent it as a short-term rental. That's a super good point. You know, there have just been some jurisdictions where it's been very difficult for owners and that's for a variety of reasons. We won't necessarily get into all the reasons, but it's certainly something that you're going to want to be thinking about. But you also mentioned earlier this idea that they're guests and not residences. So in most places, tenant landlord law doesn't apply to hotels, doesn't apply to an overnight rental, Mm -hmm. meaning that they're not creating a tenancy. So if something were to happen, and and most of your guests pay in advance, I'm guessing, right? Mm -hmm. But if something were to happen, you can legally get them out a lot easier. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we've, times have been really hard for a lot of people. We've had these eviction moratoriums. uh, And in most situations, those wouldn't apply if they were guests in your rentals versus a long-term tenant. Now, another possible use that you kind of shared with us is the fact that you get people who are traveling on business, but they want those same amenities. They want to have a, an quote-unquote office space so they can do their Zoom calls, even though they might be traveling to a city for a face-to-face meeting or two. Mm-hmm. But rather than spend you know three weeks or six weeks in a hotel, which just gets kind of monotonous, being in a little more expansive kind of home or condominium can make sense. And so you actually do see business travelers in this kind of product. Yeah, we do. I, we have business travelers staying with us right now, some that have been in there for months. 
and they're paying nightly rates. So it's exactly what you're saying. I mean, and I'm, I'm kind of the same way too. You know, I travel a lot and, you know, when I'm looking at new markets, I, I'm going to stay there usually for a, a little bit of a fair amount of time. And so I stay in short-term rentals everywhere and having the kitchen, having the space, uh, it's just kind of a, it's a new trend in living. And I think, especially with millennials, you know, are kind of more mobile than a lot of the other demographics. It's just, you know, times have changed a little bit and, and uh, we're a little more mobile than we have been without the, the COVID restrictions. So a lot of reasons on the front end of it, understanding that you've got people that will stay for all sorts of reasons and you can manipulate vacancy and occupancy based on things like pricing and, and so on, just like the big mm -hmm. hotels do. But the other thing about this is it does provide an exit strategy that's a little different. If I were able to come up with enough money to buy an 80 room boutique hotel, I only have one exit strategy. And that is to sell to somebody else that wants an 80 room boutique hotel. But when you own an overnight rental, many times you could find a owner occupant to sell to. If you wanted to get out, you could find a landlord and have a tenant. You might decide, hey, right now it makes better sense to put a month to month tenant in. Mm -hmm. So also a lot of flexibility in this. Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite pieces about it. And that is my ultimate backup plan. You know, if regulations change or it doesn't work out like I expected as a short-term rental, I can put long-term tenants back in these properties because they're in areas that work well with long-term tenants too. And, and during COVID, when things first happened, I, I was down in Brazil and the world was, was caving in, it seemed like. You know, we didn't know what was going on. And I did change a couple rentals into long-term tenants I, remotely, you know, but it was, I didn't know what was going on. And People weren't allowed to travel. And so that was, it's a really good backup strategy. All right. I love that. Now, speaking of the fact that you travel a lot, that kind of begs the question, wait a minute, how do you operate one of these things? You're traveling all over the world. You own these units. How does management work? It's not like a property manager in a long-term month-to-month single family home. So talk about that part. Because I think before people got all enamored about uh, short-term rentals, they got to understand that it's a bit of a puzzle to figure out. Yeah, there, there's certainly more pieces than there are with a long-term rental. I mean, uh, our average stays a little over three nights, which means we've got a lot of people checking in, a lot of people checking out. So we have some on the ground pieces that we have to have in place. And those are our housekeeping, which is the biggest one, and then our maintenance. But basically everything outside of that, you know, the guest communications, the checking in to the physical locations, all of that we can set up virtually. And there's tons of tools to help with that now, to automate it, much more tools than there were say five years ago. I mean, the, the industry's really exploded and along with that, there's been a lot of improvements in the software and the, and the tools that we have available. So, Boy, that's for sure. It's amazing, actually, how much uh, information can be at your fingertips. We'll talk about that and more when we come back with Tim Hubbard. We'll play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, it's Robert Helms. Thanks so much for listening to the show today. I want to personally invite you to come see an amazing real estate market that combines excellent cash flow, offshore diversification, and what we affectionately call lifestyle investing. Come join me from August 20th to 23rd in the beautiful country of Belize. The real estate guys have been bringing investors to Belize for more than 15 years now, and our discovery trip is designed to show you the market like nobody else can. Sure, Belize is breathtakingly beautiful. The people are wonderful and wait till you taste the food. But the real opportunity is the real estate investment potential. Demand for offshore real estate has skyrocketed since the coronavirus shutdown. And with retirees looking for lifestyle, the work from home workforce able to be productive from afar and tourism coming back strong, now may be the perfect time to consider Belize as a place to diversify risk in your investment portfolio. There's all types of opportunities in Belize when it comes to real estate investing, including both long and short-term rentals, commercial and retail triple net properties, business opportunities, land acquisition, development, agriculture, and more. As the only country in Latin America with English as its official language, it's easy to understand the law. Property rights are strong and contracts are written in English. 
and in Ambergris Key, a unique situation exists where demand for rentals continues to outstrip supply, creating a compelling environment for investors. So come see for yourself. Join me in August in Ambergris Key, Belize, as we study the market, learn about the sustainable drivers, and tour lots of beautiful real estate. And like all of our field trips, there are no properties for sale during the weekend. Rather, you'll meet lots of local providers that will help educate you about the market so that you can follow up with them after the trip if the market is interesting to you. You've heard about Belize and the Real Estate Guys for all these years. Now come see what all the excitement is about. Plus, we'll have lots of time over meals and activities to talk about all things real estate. To get the details, go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click on events where you'll find the Belize Discovery Trip. Once you register, you'll get information about our group hotel rates as well as travel details. So join me in Belize, August 20th to 23rd. It's a beautiful country with lots of amazing possibilities. And the only thing missing is you. Go to realestateguysradio.com under events and I look forward to seeing you in beautiful Belize. Hi, this is Lawrence Yoon, Chief Economist with National Association of Realtors, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. Hope you made plans to join us for the 19th Annual Investor Summit. If you haven't, it's too late. We just sold out, folks, for the second time. Added some chairs, but now we are absolutely positively full. Don't worry, we'll probably do the 20th one next year. Today marks episode one of our three-part series on how you can profit in the hospitality niche in real estate. Before we get back to our conversation with Tim Hubbard on short-term rentals, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia, your chance to win a prize. By knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question, in just a minute when you hear the question, you're going to want to fire off your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address because if you're the winner, we're gonna send you this awesome compilation book called Resilience, Turning Your Setback Into a Comeback. It's a collection of awesome stories from great folks like Tim Hubbard, who has a chapter in this book. That can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week, we had Dr. Mark Skousen on the program, one of the top 10 living economists. We asked this, how was Mount Rushmore named? Yeah, everyone knows Mount Rushmore, right? The four presidents. How was that mountain named? Well, the mountain took its name incredibly from a New York attorney who was there on business who just happened to ask the name of the location back in around 1884. A local man with the group looking at the mountain said, you know, it doesn't have a name, but let's name it now. Let's name it Rushmore Peak. That's according to a letter from Charles Rushmore, the attorney who was in the area for a client doing research at the time. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. For the year 2020, which airport had the most passengers? You have all the airports in the world. 2020 was a curtailed year in terms of travel, but one of the airports still number one in terms of passengers. If you think you know or just want to guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address. The first person that gets it right gets this awesome book with Tim Hubbard in it, Resilience, Turning Your Setback Into a Comeback. That's today's real estate trivia question. It's part one of our three-part series, taking a deep dive into the hospitality industry. Is there an opportunity today and can individual investors play? Our guest is our good friend, Tim Hubbard. We met many years ago on the Investor Summit. Looking forward to having you in a few weeks on the, the 19th annual Investor Summit. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really looking forward to being there. Best, best group of people ever. It's good stuff. And uh, it's a lot of folks like yourself that have figured out a niche and then just share about it, which is super Super cool. We'll ask you if you're willing again to do a roundtable on this uh, topic. Uh, every uh, few days we do these roundtable discussions where someone leads a discussion on a topic. I think this would be great for that as just another thriving area post-pandemic, if you will. But Tim, we were talking about some of the tools and so forth, and this varies as much as the markets do. Sometimes there is a market and a demand where all you need to do is affiliate with one of the, you know, overnight rental companies and boom, you're good. But there's a lot more mm -hmm. just in terms of driving revenue and those kinds of things. In the hospitality business, how do you set your price? Well, in most of the world, hotel prices are static, meaning they have a rate card. They say, this is how much we charge for a room. And if they charge $200 a night for a room, 
any night that they're sold out, they left money on the table because if they'd use something called dynamic pricing, they could change and bring the rate up higher as demand dictated. At the same time, any night that they're not sold out, they've also left money on the table if they were at a $200 rate. Had they have followed that same model and lowered their price a little bit, they would now be able to rent some of the rooms that went unrented. We say in hospitality that once tonight is gone, it's gone forever. I can't rent tonight's room except for tonight. So that's one of the interesting tools that before wasn't really available in the short-term market and now is. Yeah, certainly. It's one of the biggest tools and it's come a long way. I've been using dynamic pricing in the short-term rental space and they've added so many features, so many ways to account for demand, to account for day of the week, for seasonality, for events in the area. And it's all automated, or it can all be automated, I should say. You know, sometimes I don't even look at our pricing for a month at a time because I trust the software that much. Uh, you know, we have max rates and we have low rates, and then we have a base rate, and the algorithms just calculate based off that. So definitely that, that's one of the best, one of the better tools. And then of course, there's the whole asset management part of it or, or the day-to-day the -day management, if you will. Someone moves out, you've got to clean the room and that has to get communicated and you need folks on the ground. If a guest has a problem or a challenge, they need to be able to reach out. But it's astounding how much of that is automated today. The guest feels like they're getting wonderful update emails from you or your manager, mm -hmm. but all of that, or a lot of it at least, has been programmed in advance. Yep, absolutely. I mean, there's there's um, everything, you know, we, we send out digital guidebooks, check-in instructions go out automatically based on time frames and how far in advance you want. You know, there's lock systems that can automatically generate unique codes for new guests and integrate with your property management software so you don't have to do any of that. You can automate it from, from start to finish. Of course, it's always nice to have a, a personal touch in there, you know, and, and there's ways to do that as well. There really are so many, so many tools now. And actually, you know, a lot of people that are staying in short-term rentals now, I would say 75% or more of our guests, they book instantly, which means they're not asking us about our properties before they actually book them. Uh, it also means they're going to receive their check-in instructions automatically. Sometimes our guests don't even really communicate with us that much. You know, we, we send out the information, they booked automatically, they have a good stay, they leave us a review and... And it's kind of the cycle continues. So Well, today, obviously, those kinds of reviews drive a lot of travel. It's true in hotels and it's true in overnight rentals. People want to know what the accommodations were like. What was the service like? What could you go see and do? And you mentioned something about that, the, the guidebook idea, which is actually, think about staying in a nice, fancy hotel. You go down to concierge and they tell you all the places to eat and places to tour and museums nearby and so forth. Well, you guys have taken that and really made it personal, like within a few blocks blocks from where you're staying. Yeah. Here are some cool places to go and, and see. And that, that really is a neat personal touch. Yeah. The guidebooks are great. And it's something, you know, you, you set up and you, maybe you update every couple months or something like that, but we get really great feedback on them. Those go out automatically. They're mobile friendly. So someone pulls it up on their phone. It's plugged in with GPS. So they know how far our recommendations are. Uh, and you can, you can take those much, much further and you can break down a property, say it's a, a large vacation rental, for example, and it has a spa there that maybe isn't super intuitive. You can, you can include video instructions for the spa on your guidebook. You can, I mean, so many, so many things you can do to really answer a lot of the questions your guests might have before they ask them. Uh, and, and that's all automated, too, with a lot of these tools. Well, Tim, I know you've bumped your head around a bit trying to figure all this out and putting together different tools, trying things. Certain things don't work. Certain things do. So much to the point that you now help people understand this and train people in this industry. And I remember we first started talking about this. And, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't necessarily see yourself uh, leading a bunch of people at the front of the room. But my goodness, the feedback's been great. You, you First of all, you've been doing it for so long you really do understand every single aspect of it you're in different markets you have great teams in those areas but you've kind of mastered the whole technique so talk about this the fact that you now train folks who may be brand new to this industry on how they get started and what they need to do to thrive yeah no it's it's been a, a ton of fun i mean i basically 
yeah, I have been doing this for a long time and I've done it in multiple markets and I've stayed in hundreds and hundreds of short-term rentals around the world. So I have a, and I continue to, so it's constantly being updated. But before COVID, we, we did a couple live events for a ton of fun, showed, you know, a smaller group of, of people how I'm doing everything. We saw some of my properties, uh, gave them all the tools that I'm using and, and recommendations, depending on what level in short-term rentals you're at. Some people just starting out, some people have a few, some people want to have a hundred and there's different things that we need to do at each, each level. So yeah, it has been a lot of fun. Well, and the feedback has been great because many people understand bread and butter real estate. Maybe they have some month to month uh, rentals, but they don't always understand all the intricacies of what we've been talking about, but you make it super simple for that. Uh, and I think before we're done, we'll let folks know about your next training, which is coming up at the end of July. But take us through this, you know, you hear people talk about Airbnb or home away or VRBO or a hundred other types of sites. Mm -hmm. How much of that matters? And do you use multiple sites and, and how does that all integrate? Those are kind of the big brand names people know, and you certainly are able to show people how to tap into that. Yeah. So, so we have software to integrate all of those as well. Uh, we, we call it a channel manager. So make sure that if we get a booking from Airbnb, that we don't get a booking from VRBO on the same dates. <laughs> that can be included. It's included in a lot of property management software. So they basically just share a calendar and when one books up, the other one blocks. And it's interesting, you know, using the different travel sites, we get different types of guests from the different travel sites too. So that's something that we need to be aware of. Vacation rental by owner, VRBO, for example, traditionally people looking for vacation rentals, you know, whereas Airbnb uh, has the whole scheme, the whole range, but we see a lot more urban type travelers coming in and, and they're different. They're different age ranges. Uh, so it's, it's good to know those and, and have some expectations. If you're going on new booking sites, booking.com is different. TripAdvisor is different. Uh, I think the goal really though, or at least for me is, is to get repeat guests and to drive them to our own websites. And so that's something that we, we do as well. So there's a lot of different ways to do the, the marketing for sure. Well, that's a really good point. You know, once someone has gone through whatever they've gone through to pick the market, find your property and stay there. Well, now that's a client that's probably more predisposed to coming back and doing business with you. Just like in the hotel business, you get people that are brand loyalists mm -hmm. or people that go to the same hotel every year because they get to know the staff and they like the market and they, they, they like the attractions around there. So that's a something I won't even have necessarily thought of, but marketing to the existing customers, which is a whole nother art and science to figure out how you keep people engaged when it's a place they stayed for three days, you know, a year ago. Yeah, definitely. And, and different types of rentals are going to have more uh, loyalty to, you know, if it's a, if it's a unique vacation rental out on the beach, that might see a lot more consistency year in and year out as a family enjoys going back to the same spot versus maybe a place that's a little more urban and a little more of a commodity type. But it, it really is, you know, we, we get the same guests coming back over and over and over again and just makes it really nice. So I, while some rentals may have more of that, I think there's a place for that with all different types of rentals for sure. Well, and we've said many times that your you know, markets are different. Your mileage may vary and every market's a little different. But let's talk if, if we can in, in general uh, terms about kind of price range. How do you pick within a market? Is it the high end? Is it middle? Is it low end? How do you approach a market and decide? I know you're out looking at some new markets right now. In fact, how do you decide where the sweet spot is? I like to run the numbers as a long-term rental first. So if I'm looking at the property and that'll help with financing and acquiring the property too, because uh, the financing with short-term rentals is a bit of a gray area for a lot of traditional lenders still. So I typically like to find properties that already have long-term tenants in it. It's already cash flowing. Right. I know it's a good investment from day one, regardless of whether or not I'm doing short-term rentals. And so those properties aren't likely going to be in the heart of downtown or in the most expensive suburb of a city, you know, there's a price point there where that's going to make sense. So I start there. And for me, a lot of those areas have kind of been in between a, you know, like in between downtown and the suburbs and like the midtown areas. So that's really what I base it off. And then from there, you know, there's all kinds of tools we can use to run 
comps on short-term rentals now. So I'll look up what the, the nightly rates are on average and if they're seasonality. And so we really do have a lot of information now at our fingertips that we can look for properties remotely uh, before we actually go there. Well, I love the baseline being, hey, it has to perform as a month-to-month -month rental. If it'll do that, then we layer on this other use that can increase the yield and then it's all good. Now, uh, coming up at the end of July, first part of August, you're going to do a training. This takes place in Memphis, Tennessee. Take us through what folks would learn if they came out to this training, Tim. Yeah, so, so we'll definitely dive into how to find these properties, you know, the things I look for. We'll, we'll review some case studies, some properties that I purchased, uh, and how to go about finding one. So that's going to be like the first step. Uh, but then we'll talk about how to set these up as short-term rentals the best way to do that, the best tools to use now, software, essentially everything I've used or I've used at some point. And then we'll talk about operating them, you know, how we can operate these from thousands of miles away or wherever we want to be and still get good reviews and, and still uh, earn great revenue. And then I always like to kind of tack on like a little piece about scaling, how we can go from one market to another market, but use some of the same tools to make it easier to, to scale. And we'll visit some of my properties too, which is probably most people's favorite part because we get to see them in operation. I'm not, you know, uh, in the past, I haven't stopped my properties. You know, we show up and there's housekeepers there and there's guests checking in, guests checking out. So we get to see like, real life, how this is all put together and how it all works. Well, that's a strategic uh, reason to do it in Memphis. One of the several markets that you're in is that you can actually walk people through this. I mean, it's one thing to learn from, you know, slides and, and, you know, you talking about it, but to be able to show people, this is the difference. This is, looks like any other condo, except you'll notice this particular lockbox is one that they can access through a code. And here's what we do in terms of reporting any challenges or any problems. And here's how it's outfitted and mm -hmm. love that part of it. So very, very hands-on. Uh, it takes place uh, at the end of July, first part of August. And if you want to learn more about what Tim's doing, he's put together an awesome report. It's called Your Guide to the Ultimate Short-Term Rental Property Returns. And to get a copy of that, you just send an email to short-term at realestateguysradio.com, short-term at realestateguysradio.com. You'll get uh, the report, but you'll also get uh, Tim's details. And if you want to come out to that uh, session, you can learn more about it. Maybe you've already got a couple of these properties. You just want to get to the next level. Or maybe you're just thinking, wow, this could be another exciting niche. I think it's good to hear that uh, the niche is actually not only sustained, but done pretty well during the pandemic. Yeah, it has. I mean, uh, it's it's shocked me. And I'm still, I, you know, I've throughout the years or throughout covid they've still done better than what the long-term rentals would have done, even with, with the large drop in occupancy. Now, this is just the markets I'm in. I know some got affected a lot more than others, but some did much better. So it's, it's kind of across the board, but I'm really excited because, well, there's a lot of pent up demand. People haven't traveled in a long time, right? And we love traveling and people are, are gonna be getting out there again. So the fact that we're doing, doing really well and probably the worst year for, for travel in history. And then it's just now starting to come back. It's pretty exciting. It's awesome. And if you think about the fact that the ones that are staying in the units are the ones willing to travel now, there's a whole bunch that will be in the coming months and years. And then, unfortunately, there will be some folks that didn't make the turn. There will be people with short-term rentals who had maybe financing issues and, and those are no longer on the market or they went to just a straight month-to-month -month rental because of that. And so I think this is definitely a growth area and uh, we appreciate uh, you checking in with us and sharing your expertise. If you'd like to get a copy of Tim's free report, just send an email to short-term at realestateguysradio.com. You can learn about his event uh, at the end of July, or you can come on out to the Investor Summit in beautiful Belize and get to know Tim uh, personally. Always great conversations that happen at the summit. We'll look forward to seeing you there, Tim. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, thanks for having me on again. Thanks for your time today. That's Tim Hubbard from his company, Rest Methods. More when we come back, you're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Real Estate Guys listeners, are you tired of losing real estate deals due to financing issues? 
Have you had enough of waiting on banks, lenders, and investor groups to fund new projects? What if there were a way to eliminate all the hassle and invest in real estate on your own terms? I'm here to tell you there is. Patrick Donahoe here from Paradigm Life. I'm an Investopedia top 100 most influential financial advisor, and I recently wrote a best-selling book about the financial strategy that changed my entire investment model, and the one that could change yours. To get a copy of my book for free and learn how you can maximize your real estate portfolio by acting as your own bank, send an email to mybank at realestateguysradio.com. Don't make another real estate deal without reading my book first. Email mybank at realestateguysradio.com now to get your copy for free. Hungry for more real estate investing ideas? Here's two steps you can take today. First, go to realestateguysradio.com and sign up for our weekly newsletter. You'll get access to a continuous feed of thought-provoking commentary specifically for real estate investors while also focusing on broader picture economics. Then, once you're at our site, look for the Resources tab where you'll find our amazing collection of special reports. Browse dozens of white papers, webinars, and market reports and request the ones that appeal to you. What are you waiting for? Head to realestateguysradio.com to implement education for effective action. Having trouble finding deals where the numbers make sense? Invest in an asset class that delivers cash flow to you in good times and bad, and where most of that cash flow is tax-free. I'm Dave Zook. Many of you have heard me speak at Real Estate Guys events or heard me on their podcast. My team is a top five ATM operator in the country, and right now accredited investors can make cash flow returns well into the double digits and get huge tax deductions. For your free report on this lucrative asset class, email atm at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Darren Hardy, author of The Compound Effect, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks so much for tuning into the program. Hey, if you ever wanted to do bigger deals using other people's money, then you need to master the art of real estate syndication. We can help you out twice a year. We do our two-day event called The Secrets of Successful Syndication. The next one takes place in mid-September in Dallas, Texas. You can get all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com under the tab that says events. It is uh, episode number one of three on hospitality. And I think we started off with a bang. Great to hear from Tim Hubbard. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I really appreciate Tim because first of all, he loves what he does. He's enthusiastic about it. He does it the right way because he really focuses on the customer. Uh, instead of the business or the profitability. And so he drives profitability by being customer focused. You know, you listen to him think about ways to operate more efficiently, but it's all not based around driving the bottom line. It's about driving the customer experience. And it sounds like a subtle difference, but the thing is so many people think they can cut and they can trim and they can leave things out as a way to drive profitability. And really the answer is to add value and to get people who are willing and happy to pay and come back and refer from friends. And then you also hear the other side of it, though, is just the pragmatic business person that he is in terms of systems, procedures, proper infrastructure, uh, refinements, tools. And the fact that he's an open book and willing to share all of it, you know, because he really didn't start out to be a guru. You know, the gurus that like, hey, I want to be a guru, but he didn't start out to do that. No. I remember talking with him when I first felt like I got to know him. He'd been in our world for a little bit, but, you know, there's a lot of people circulating our world and you don't get a chance to know them until you're hanging out with them on the summit. And I remember talking with him and he told me what he was into. I'm like, oh, that's so fascinating. You know, I really wasn't all that familiar with Airbnb. I was hearing about it. And he was explaining to me what he was doing. And then as I've watched, watched him evolve and the way he's integrated his lifestyle into it and been able to really do what Kiyosaki talks about in cash flow quadrant going from being uh, an S, a self-employed person where you're wearing all the hats and you're doing all the work to really being a B where you own assets that pay you to own them and other people are doing the vast majority, if not all of the work. Yeah, you're involved at a strategic level. But the fact that he, he's got that thing dialed and shares it, it's one thing to say, here's my success story. Here's what I did. It's another thing to say, here's my success story. Here's what I did. Here's exactly how I did it. And let me show you. <laughs> I mean, that's huge. I'm, I'm tempted, actually. I've got a killer summer, but I'm tempted to actually go to that training. I'm anxious to see him in action. 
I've heard such good things about it. No, we continue to get great feedback. I think at the end of the day, it's because he's just a real down-to-earth guy. He's exactly how he shows up. He's no nonsense. He's figured it out. He's bumped his head along the way, and he shares all that stuff. And it's great when folks like that succeed. There's a lot of people in real estate, you know, the smoke and mirrors out there that puff up and they teach stuff they don't actually do and they pretend to know things and they repackage other people's material. And that's not Tim at all. He almost had to have his arm twisted to go out and do this, not because he doesn't have a heart to teach, but because he just didn't, that wasn't his vision, wasn't to have an economic model based on, you know, teaching people how to do it. It's just, there's a tremendous need and there's a few folks out there who teach it, but not that many. And certainly watching the way Tim has approached it has been great. He tries something out. He documents it. If it works well, he shares it. If it doesn't work well, he shares why. And he's open to other ideas. People that come to this event sometimes already have a few vacation rentals or overnight rentals, short-term rentals under their belt. And it's very interactive that way. And he's just an unassuming guy. And uh, he does have a great report. Again, this is uh, just information. If you've maybe not considered short-term rentals before and you just like to get uh, his take on it, his report is called Your Guide to the Ultimate Short-Term Rental Property Returns. And all you have to do to get that report is just send an email to short-term at realestateguysradio.com. Big thanks to Tim for sharing his wisdom on the program and for sharing what he does with the world at his workshops. Next week, we're going to explore kind of a different and very cool aspect of hospitality, and we've got another great guest. Until then, go out short-term and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.